Um, and it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Daniel Brown to our, uh, our very own rock star, many years research legend to our webinar tonight. I'm super, super excited that he's speaking with us. Uh, Daniel is a hearing and balance physiologist with particular focus on many ears disease. After being awarded a PhD in auditory neuroscience from the University of Western Australia in 2007, he undertook a two-year fellowship at the Washington University, St. Louis, before returning to start up a new laboratory in, at the Sydney University in 2009. During this time, he developed new methods of objectively diagnosing many ears disease, new animal models of many ears, and new approaches to quantifying functional and morphological changes in the inner ear. He was awarded the uh, Barony, Bar Barony Society Award for Best Mid-Career Researcher in 2018. In 2019, he moved to the Curtin University in Western Australia to start up a new hearing and balance laboratory and began on working um, on new therapies for treating inner ear disorders. In 2020, as a team of four, he was awarded the overall Curtin uh, a Curtin Innovation Award for the investigation of repurposing an anti-hyperlipidemic drug to prevent ototoxicity, which the team has subsequently patented. At Curtin, he is the uh, discipline lead for human biomedicine and the course coordinator for uh, human biology. Thank you so much, Daniel, for joining us. We're so excited. Tag team, you're it. <laughs> Thanks very much, Julian. Uh, well, thanks very much, everybody, for, for joining uh, online. It's really good to be back in front of a bunch of many years sufferers and people who are interested in many years disease. Um, being in Sydney, we sort of had that regular connection with you all where basically every uh, every year at least, so we sort of gave one presentation throughout the year. Uh, but the last three, four years now, um, I've sort of lacked that uh, that contact with most of you, so it's it's nice to be invited back to to present to you today and to let you know that I haven't uh, I haven't gone off into the ether. I'm still very much uh, focused on many years disease, um, and really I've just taken my research on many years and just progressed it uh, at Curtin University. Um, and so with that, I'm just going to share my screen and uh, get started with the presentation. Uh, do uh, I do this that one there um hang on I would share is that going to work Start with just a broad overview of what I've sort of achieved over the last uh 14 or 15 years of studying many years disease uh, and and that'll give you a feel for the approach to that's led me to where I'm at with my current research so so obviously, uh, Julian gave me the, the introduction. I've been probably studying many, or I've been studying many as these since 2007, at least. And over the last uh, 10 to 15 years, um, one, we've done lots of different things. We sort of started out by developing uh, the tools for detecting and quantifying endolymphatic high drops, both in animal models of endolymphatic high drops or animal models of many years disease, but also in, in patients with endolymphatic high drops or if you like many years disease as well. Uh, and we needed to do the start there because if I'm going to work on sort of understanding the endolymph, what causes, and I, I'm going to use the terms endolymphatic high drops and many years disease interchangeably because I am of the opinion that, that endolymphatic high drops really does underlie the symptoms of many years. Uh, and so when I talk about endolymphatic high drops, I'm basically talking about many years disease as well. Uh, and I need basically to work on the tools because you can't see in the inner ear very easily. And as a physiologist, we need to measure it and quantify it if we're going to study it and then ultimately provide uh, therapies. Um, beyond the, uh, developing a series of different tools that we could use in animals and also then use in humans, and I'm still uh, working with a, an ENT over here at uh, Fiona Stanley Hospital in Perth to further progress the diagnostic tests for endolymphatic high drops in the clinic. Uh, beyond that step, we then moved on to developing new animal models of endolymphatic high drops so we could kind of work on understanding what causes it and developing treatments. And we went, I went through a 
uh, phase of research probably from 2015 to 2018 where I was inducing N lymphatic hydrox chronically in, in guinea pigs uh, and, and it was a new model uh, and it allowed us to basically have a, have a, a really nice um, model of Meniere's disease, one which was more realistic to the potential causes of, of Meniere's and I'll talk about that a little bit in this presentation as well. Uh, we also came up with some new theories on what could be underlying vertigo attacks um, in, in, in many of sufferers. Again, related to what does high drops do? Does it cause ruptures of the membranous labyrinth and mixing of the in ear fluids? Or is it causing a pressure disruption and movement of fluids from, say, the cochlea into the vestibular system and triggering a vertigo attack? Uh, as Julianne uh, mentioned, uh, since moving across to Curtin in 2019, uh, I was at that stage, probably about 2018, 2019, I'd had enough of just sort of developing animal models. I was, I'd gotten so many, many air sufferers basically saying, yes, but when's the, you know, when's the magic bullet coming on? When, 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 what, when are you going to give us hope? What, when are we going to develop treatments? And so I had to jump ship to basically just going gangbusters. I'm not a pharmaceutical scientist. I don't uh, profess to, to, to be developing new, new novel drugs in, in the laboratory. So basically I started looking at what are the, the drugs that are out there for treating the ear disorders and seeing if we could uh, improve their delivery and their efficacy or do, using drugs that are already available and using them to treat many ears disease. And, and stemming from that in 2019, 2020, uh, we basically came across this drug. Well, we, I was lucky enough in moving across to Curtin University, there was a group of researchers that were already working on this particular drug called Probicol. And we've subsequently then moved, used Probicol in the inner ear and established that it can actually provide a lot of therapeutic uh, benefits to uh, hearing loss sufferers. And uh, we've, got a, we've got a patent on that. And basically the next phase of the research is going to be looking at whether or not this drug can alleviate uh, many ear disease, in, at least in the animals, before it gets to the clinic. Um, I've also supervised a number of PhD students and, and, post, and hosted a number of postdocs in my labs over the year as well. Um, and basically, I, uh, I think I've developed a bit of a reputation as a global expert on many ears disease. Um, certainly, uh, there's a many ears disease and any ear disorders um, symposium, which uh, is a large uh, international conference. It was due to initially occur in 2020, but subsequently due to COVID continues to get bumped. And even though the little slide there says it's coming, coming around in April, 2023, it's again been bumped to 2024, just because of the COVID outbreak in China. And I'm one of the four uh, um, uh, scientific advisors for that particular conference. Um, and so I've sort of got myself a bit of a reputation, at least around the world uh, on, as an expert on many years disease research. Um, in moving to Curtin, one of the, there was a few reasons why I moved from Sydney University to Curtin University. Um, one of the main ones was really that I'd had, uh, I'd been employed at Sydney University from 2007 to 2019. And the entire time I had been, uh, my salary was coming from philanthropy, uh, from the Many Years Research Fund, Inc. Uh, but 80% of the time, or 80% of that, that, that time period, I was also getting just, my salary was funded from my own grants. And we call that soft money. Basically, if I didn't get a grant, I was out of a job. And had a, I was about 2018, 2019, I started a young family. I needed job security. I couldn't get that at, at Sydney University, despite the fact that we had done well to, significant, to raise significant research funds. I was also struggling to get a lot of support for many of disease research at Sydney University. And it was basically, I just determined that it was best for myself and my family and also for my research to move across to Curtin University where I was able to get a continuing position. Uh, and obviously being from Western Australia, my wife and I, it was, uh, it was better for our family life as well. Uh, but there's been a lot of other significant benefits from moving here that, um, that have helped me a lot as well. Um, in moving to Curtin, uh, I've had increased funding success. Um, strangely enough, there's a lot more um, interest in hearing research, and particularly many of disease research uh, over here than, than what I was finding at Sydney University. Uh, collaboration has increased. I'm collaborating with many more researchers in Perth, but also nationally now as well. Um, I was able to use some funds that I had uh, by virtue of Curtin paying my salary. I could basically take those funds and, and recruit uh, Associate Professor Young Doon CO uh, from his oh, ENT. Oh, I'm getting a lot of feedback. And can you hear that? Yeah, Danny, you started to loop. 
Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know what's okay. It's gone now. Is everyone can hear me? Yep. Okay, fantastic. Sorry, it's good to talk. Um, so yeah, Young, uh, he's a well-renowned uh, ENT surgeon scientist from Korea. He came uh, down in uh, 2020 and has been with me for the last two years. Um, and brought a wealth of knowledge uh, to do with um, encapsulation of drugs and a whole bunch of other techniques, um, which basically has really exploded my own research as well. I've got collaboration with surgeon scientists, other surgeon scientists at Fiona Stanley. I've got some collaborations with the Ear Science Institute of Australia as well. And that's also ultimately um, culminated in a significant in increase in my research outputs with publications, my publication rate going from about two or three papers a year to up to sort of more five to six, almost seven papers a year. Uh, and I'm hoping to sort of stay there. So my research outputs have actually grown quite a lot um, since moving across to Curtin, which has been quite nice. Uh, in addition to that, uh, as Julian mentioned, uh, we also were fortunate um, to win the 2020 Curtin Innovation Award, which is basically an award given to the best um, research uh, project in each year from within Curtin. And that was a bit of a boon and drew a lot, drew a lot of interest uh, to hearing research at Curtin, even though I'd been only at Curtin for, for, for one year. Um, and so, to summarize the, my research approach over the, since 2007 up until today, just very quickly, as I mentioned, we needed to develop the tools for monitoring high drops, did that when we wanted to develop the animal models of N-lymphatic high drops, we did that. We also developed the tools for imaging and quantifying high drops, but also for quantifying where drugs might go in the inner ear because we, I knew that we wanted to start working on drug delivery. And you can't simply say, I'm going to give someone a drug orally or if I'm going to squirt a, a drug into through the eardrum, and you can't assume that it's going to get into the inner ear. Uh, you have to know that the drug is going to get there. Otherwise, if it, if it doesn't get there, you might apply a drug and say it doesn't do anything when really it would have done had you just worked on getting the drug into the in-ear fluids. And so getting drugs into the in-ear uh, and proving that the drugs are there at, at significant levels is also one of the main things I've been working on for the last five or six years as well. And since being at Curtin, as I mentioned, we've also then been working on new drugs for treating many ear disease, which I'm quite uh, excited about. Um, and there's, there's actually a, several drugs that are emerging as uh, being um, uh, quite good for treating many ear disease. Uh, one of the things I've started to realize over the last few years is that whilst we may start to develop new treatments for many ear disease in terms of drugs, um, most of these drugs aren't going to work unless we can um, we can continuously put them into the inner ear of, of many ear sufferers. And in order to do that, we're going to have to look at new avenues for getting drugs into the inner ear uh, longitudinally. Uh, and also we have to ask the question, when are we supposed to be putting these drugs into the inner ear of many ear sufferers? Because there's, you, know, you can basically put a, tish, a, 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 a micro wick or a drug, uh, uh, something that's soaked in a drug and you put that into the middle, middle ear of a many ear sufferer and it can leach the drug into the inner ear over a period of weeks um, to, to maybe months in a many ear sufferer, but that might coincide with a, a period of time where the many ear sufferer is fine anyway. So you're basically treating them even though they're not developing any symptoms at that time. So you need to need to work on optimizing when we actually get uh, deliver the drugs. And that's really what I wanna talk about today, um, at least towards the end of this presentation. Um, and so, as I mentioned, I'm very much of the view that uh, end lymphatic high drops is the underlying uh, cause of the symptoms of many ears disease. Uh, what causes end lymphatic high drops? I don't know. It's most likely that it's some kind of autoimmune in ear disorder that's brought about and maybe um, uh, as a, gonna, is results from various underlying disorders, whether you've got a genetic predisposition to developing a particular type of autoimmune in ear disorder that ultimately manifests as in lymphatic high drops and that causes the symptoms. It could be a, a, an allergy, it could be some kind of infection. There's a whole bunch of things that could cause in lymphatic high drops. I've, you might argue that you, if you want to cure many ears disease, you're going to have to look at curing these various underlying um, pathologies. But for my mind, I'm not an autoimmune researcher. I'm not a geneticist. I, I, I don't necessarily have the tools for treating these various disorders uh, or these various causes. And there's not a lot of evidence that shows that you can effectively treat these types of disorders in disorders where it's known that that is the cause. So 
uh, it still remains today that treating various autoimmune disorders is a tricky, um, a tricky task. And so you're much, I have felt that I'm much going to be better off, uh, suited and, and, and better uh, serve the mini community by trying to treat and come up with treatments for any lymphatic hydrops rather than trying to come up with cures for autoimmune or genetic disorders uh, in my lifetime, at least anyway. Um, now, one of the problems with, uh, with many is, is obviously you can't easily see any lymphatic hydrops. And that's why we've been, then I mentioned, we had sort of went around this process of developing the tools for uh, quantifying and visualizing and lymphatic hydrops. Um, we had a whole bunch of uh, electrophysiological measurements in, in animals, and we had techniques for inducing um, and lymphatic hydrops to see what that would do to cochlear and vestibular function and mimicking the types of symptoms that many air sufferers get in animals, and then imaging the entire inner ear to get a feel for what exactly was going on. And that basically led us to some conclusions about whether or not ruptures of the membranous labyrinth were causing uh, many as disease or vertigo attacks uh, or it might be instead something like fluid pressure shuffling between the different inner ear fluid field compartments uh, causing uh, sudden episodic vertigo um, attacks so uh, that was basically the sort of research i was doing probably around 2015 um, and it's resulted in a lot of interest around what exactly causes the ruptures. Other researchers have sort of progressed that. There's a lot of interest in about this particular small structure that lies between the cochlea and the vestibular system called the, the um, valve of vast. Um, I'm still not 100% sure exactly what underlies all forms of, of vertigo attacks in many as sufferers, uh, and it is important to understand exactly what's causing those those. Um, those vertigo attacks because if you kind of come up with a treatment you're going to have to basically you, you're trying to when you when you come up with a treatment you've got to look at what it is that you're trying to prevent and if you're trying to prevent a, a, a rupture of the membranous habit that's one thing if you're trying to prevent fluid moving from uh, the cochlear compartment into another compartment then maybe that's a different type of drug and maybe you have to look at a different type of metric as as to what it is that you're looking for um, as, a, as, a, as a marker of how effective your drug is is working uh, moving from there, we also then, one of the things that we did was, and I've been continuing to do today, is developing a new type of microscope, I've called a light sheet microscope, that also allows me to more rapidly scan every single cochlea I get out of, out of animals to demonstrate any lymphatic and, and look at where fluid volumes and drugs are going within the inner ear. I don't want to talk too much about it. Uh, we then needed to have an animal model of any lymphatic hydrops. And to that end, what we did, uh, what I started out was with this idea of, taking a small amount of virus or a component of virus called lipipolysaccharide, pretty standard technique, and introducing it into the inner ear uh, and to see what would happen if you had immune activity occur in the inner ear. And this has sort of been done, had been done before from previously from researchers. And what previous researchers had shown was when you have immune activity in the inner ear, indeed, you end up with endolymphatic hydrops. Um, the problem with that model is that the hydrops only last for about a week and then starts to subside. Whereas we know with many air sufferers, the hydrops doesn't go away. And so what we did in difference to previous studies was to basically take the virus or the smaller bit of virus and, um, and to, to put it within uh, the end lymphatic compartment, uh, which no one had done before, to see whether or not that itself resulted in chronic end lymphatic hydrops. Uh, and there's reasons why we felt that that might be the case, that membranous labyrinth is somewhat more uh, immune privileged. So if, it's a very unique environment, the, the, the end lymphatic compartment. Uh, it's very high in uh, potassium chloride. The concentration of potassium is quite high. And if immune cells work their way into the membranous labyrinth to clear up this antigen, this foreign body that shouldn't be in the, in the end lymphatic compartment, then those immune cells will likely die as well and then themselves become uh, antigen. And so you might end up with this sort of ongoing chronic immune disorder. And so that's what we were sort of thinking. And it turns out there's been some, there seems to be some merit to that, disorder, that, that theory because these animals basically developed an endolymphatic hydrops uh, that lasted at least for six weeks and in some animals, seven or eight. I didn't sort of look much longer than that, but it was, it gave us now an animal that we could basically say, we can do this as a treatment and they will have endolymphatic hydrops for at least a couple of months. And during that 
that couple of months, we can start to implement different drug therapies to see if we can suppress the, the development uh, of the endolymphatic high drops. If they were only having high drops for a week and you will start to treat the animals with new drugs, um, then you re your window for determining whether the drugs were working or not is, is very small. And it's, it would be very difficult to, to develop different drugs and new drugs for treating endolymphatic high drops when you've only got this sort of window of endolymphatic high drops of a week. Having a much more a longer term animal model like this one is uh, a better approach in my mind. Uh, and it's basically a tool for developing the drugs for treating endolymphatic high drops and, drops and, and many a disease. Now, as I mentioned, one of the big issues with the inner ears is, is it's very difficult to get drugs into the inner ear. Um, you can have patients sort of take orally take tablets and you know, daily, and the, the drug will treat every, pretty much every cell in their entire body. Um, and a small amount of that drug might get into the inner ear. Um, as a consequence of the drug being diluted throughout your entire body, you have to take very high concentrations of the drug in order for it to have an effect in the inner ear. And that's not ideal from a clinical perspective because you, most of these drugs will have side effects and you don't wanna have a patient taking you know, high doses of, of steroids or some other type of drug on a daily uh, um, process um, for, for months at a time. It just wouldn't be uh, an ideal scenario and would create significant uh, side effects. And so the preferred approach for getting drugs into the inner ear is to simply inject the drugs through the eardrum uh, into the middle ear cavity, where you're hoping that those drugs can maybe leach into, you can deliver them through the middle ear. Um, you're hoping that you can sort of put the drugs in a bit of a gel and have those, the drug marinate and diffuse through the various mem membrane, membranous windows and then basically diffuse into the inner ear uh, and throughout the inner ear fluids itself. Um, that's, that is an emerging increasingly being used by uh, ENT surgeons and otologists as a preferred uh, route for getting drugs into the inner ear. But we also know that even that as an approach isn't ideal because what you end up, uh, what ends up happening is you get a very, very high concentration of the drug at the region where you placed it near these windows but the drug itself then gets rapidly reabsorbed into the tissues. And so not just for many ears disease, but for all sorts of inner ear disorders that are, people are trying to treat with various drugs, there's a lot of research that's being uh, uh, put into how do you encapsulate drugs? How do you get them to be delivered in such a way that you can get them to diffuse throughout the inner ear better? before they get reabsorbed to have a more of a ubiquitous effect throughout the entire inner ear. And certainly that's one of the things we're working on with various collaborators was encapsulating steroids and then trying to have those nanocapsules uh, move through the various round window and, and over window membranes and have those, the drugs diffuse uh, more evenly throughout the inner ear. And that's, and then also quantify where those drugs were going. So one of the things we were doing was having uh, dexamethasone, which is a corticosteroid. Some of you may have uh, been offered this as a therapy or had the therapy itself. Um, the surgeon often will, with a, with a cortisol, uh, no, dexamethasone uh, injection, will inject it through the eardrum as a gel. It'll load up this round window membrane and the drug can potentially diffuse through the round window membrane. Uh, but again, you, we have this issue that uh, you end up with high concentrations of the drug in the basal turn of the cochlea, but it doesn't really make its way down to the other regions of the cochlea. If you encapsulate it or you do a few other tricks, you can potentially get it to distribute throughout the inner ear in a much better way. Um, and so that's uh, one of working on quantifying and visualizing where drugs have gone throughout the inner ear has been another uh, a feather of my research, if you, if you like. Um, and then, so, so I was really focused on, on corticosteroids, on, on dexamethasone particularly for, for probably a five, period of five years there. And it started to look like, and a lot of other researchers were sort of making noises to say that, that dexamethasone or corticosteroids, they might not be the, the, the best option as a drug therapy for many a disease. Uh, corticosteroids do a, an enormous number of, uh, it, it, they, they're really complex uh, behavior on, on cells or, as, a, as a therapy. They turn on something like you know, 30,000 genes. Um, and yes, they often result in, in um, as a, they, they have an uh, anti-inflammatory approach. So they reduce swelling. Um, but they also turn on all sorts of other things. And so you don't 
really know it's a bit of a crapshoot putting in corticosteroids to sort of suppress um, inflammation within the inner ear and hoping that that just sort of uh, reduces the swelling within the inner ear and suppresses any lymphatic hydrops and provides some relief in uh, in the short term. Um, but it's probably also doing all sorts of other things to the inner ear. And in, there's actually some evidence to suggest that in many cases, corticosteroids may actually be exasperating any lymphatic high drops and causing high drops to become a little bit worse over time. And so we then went looking for you know, alternatives to corticosteroids. I'm not saying that corticosteroids are not a good option uh, for treating uh, lymphatic high drops. Um, I just felt that we'd be better off looking for alternative drugs that might be more effective at treating um, many years disease. And so with that in mind, uh, and simultaneously with this sort of emerging story that maybe some of you have heard about, um, this, this idea that Sound Pharmaceuticals, a company based out of the States, had been working with this particular drug, drug called Epsilon. And it's basically, they, they'd given it the code SPI1005. I'm not sure how many of you are aware of this particular clinical study that's ongoing throughout the world. Um, it's, it's really showing great, great promise for many of sufferers, okay? It's uh, gone through phase one and then multiple phase two studies uh, globally. And the phase two studies have shown clinically significant, uh, not just um, statistically significant, but clinically significant improvements in uh, hearing and tinnitus and a little bit uh, to do with vertigo as well, but hearing and tinnitus scores in the group that were giving Epsilon versus the placebo uh, were, were doing much better. And the results were really, really promising. Uh, they're into a phase three study that's ongoing uh, around the world as well. And early reports uh, suggest that it is, uh, it's still going to be a very, um, it will be very likely that this drug will provide uh, effective relief um, of some of the symptoms of many as disease. And if it's the case and has very few side effects, then it will likely uh, result in being the first FDA approved drug for, many, for treating many as disease. And probably that will occur maybe within the next year or two. Uh, and so it really is a, a really good news story that companies now are starting to develop new drugs for many as disease. Um, in all of these trials, I must point out that the drug is being given orally to the patients. And really what's happening is that uh, they're dosing up each of the patients. They're taking a tablet every day for three weeks, and they're looking at the, the clinical symptoms over an eight-week period. Um, I don't know if they've looked longer than that, but that's the eight-week period has been what's been reported. And sure enough, over that eight-week period, uh, people that were, were getting the, the drug versus the placebo were, were doing much better. Um, it's likely that once they go off the drug, the symptoms will probably return, okay? So it's not a cure. Epsilon is a, an antioxidant drug, a very powerful antioxidant drug. And I'll talk about what antioxidant drugs do in a, in a second, but it's something that's not going to provide a long-term treatment. It's something that's going to have to be given uh, repetitively to potentially suppress some of the ongoing symptoms of many years. But it's safe. And it doesn't seem to, and it, and it seems to provide um, clinically significant uh, uh, impacts. So what are antioxidants? What is Epsilon? Well, uh, antioxidants, uh, basically what they do is you would have all heard, you know, that blueberries are packed full of antioxidants and all these things are packed full of antioxidants. Uh, what, are, um, what are antioxidants? Well, antioxidants basically are, are drugs which either mop up or reduce the production of what's called free radicals from cells. When cells in your body are stressed, whether there's in local inflammation or immune cells come into an area, uh, or if the cells have too much neurotransmitter in a region, or if the cells aren't getting enough um, blood supply to them, they become uh, they have a low levels of oxygen, then the cells themselves, all cells in your body, start to become stressed metabolically. And as a product of being stressed, they start to produce byproducts called free radicals, which can go off and do damaging, um, have damaging effects to the cell, the cell itself, and can ultimately result in that particular cell that was stressed dying. And once that cell dies, you end up with this sort of um, uh, this reoccurring is issue where basically it becomes the immune cells have to come and get rid of this dead cell. They produce stress to nearby cells and it's sort of an ongoing self-fulfilling uh, feedback cycle. And so 
the idea that the, the, the goal here is to use antioxidants to free up and so to mop up and, and suppress the production of free radicals around cells. And uh, Epsilon is a, is a powerful antioxidant drug. It's not going to stop the immune cells from invading uh, because if there's a virus or a bacteria or a genetic disorder. Um, it's basically making sure that once the immune system's come in and doing its thing, it's not going to create too much bystander damage. And so it can, antioxidants can help uh, prevent the progression of a, dis of a disease. And it may, can also contribute to inflammation as well as anti-inflammatory effects. Uh, so it's a cure. It's, it's not a cure, but it's a good safe therapy. I mean, that's why we're all told to go off and have lots of lots of antioxidants because it's good for just making sure that our cells stay healthy. And so providing an antioxidant drug to the inner ear, that's why it's inherently safe and is a very good therapy for, or a very good option for preventing these sort of chronic disorders like many years disease as an ongoing therapy. Now, with that in mind, we basically then uh, had a look at what other antioxidant drugs there are out there in the environment. And as, it, as fate would have it with me moving across in 2019 to Curtin University, there was this ongoing study, as I mentioned from colleagues here who are using this drug called Probicol to treat Alzheimer's disease. And they've got some ongoing now quite phase three clinical trials from the use of Probicol to treat Alzheimer's disease. Probicol uh, was given as a cholesterol-lowering drug in the 1960s. Um, it was, uh, the trade name was Lorelco, and it was used internationally. There was a lot of hype about, around it. Um, it was developed by the Dow Corning Company, uh, Dow Corning Chemical Company, because it was, they did a massive screen of all the drugs that they knew that were out there and all the, uh, the combinations of, uh, of molecules that could be existence. And they came up with this particular molecule that they called Probicol, and it had the, the most um, efficacious uh, antioxidant and anti-inflammatory properties. So it's, it's a powerful antioxidant and a powerful anti-inflammatory drug. As an antioxidant, it works a little bit differently than, than um, Epsilon. Epsilon goes around and mops up free radicals. Probicol does that as well, but it does it in a slightly different fashion. Um, and probably over the last 20 years, if you go and compare a lot of research into the Epsilon drug, there's a lot of studies that are comparing it to Probicol. And in different scenarios, Probicol can be slightly better as an antioxidant than, than, the, than, than Epsilon. And so fortuitously, I was deciding to look at Probicol as an antioxidant drug for treating um, oxidative stress within the inner ear at the same time that research was looking at uh, Epsilon for treating many ears disease. One of the problems with Probicol is it's got a really, you can't dissolve it in water. And so if you want to get it into a solution that you're going to squirt into the middle ear or have that have it marinate its way throughout the inner ear, you've got to have, you've got to package it in some way, either a nanocapsule or conjugate it with it, something that, that allows it to become permeabilized and solubilized into solutions. Um, what we were basically doing was packaging it into this other carrier molecule called beta cyclextrin um, to have it transported into the inner ear fluids. Um, and the nice thing that it, it, it's also nice to whenever you've these days doing clinical trials is so difficult that if you've got colleagues who are at the same institute who are already using this particular drug of interest in a, in a, a a study that's already been given um, approval to as a clinical trial and they're using a drug and that's going to be demonstrate that it's safe. Uh, it's nice the, the ethics committees that are going to be reviewing your progress towards clinical uh, a clinical trial of the drug are going to be much more relaxed about you wanting to then ultimately try this drug out in patients. So that was another uh, thing that we were looking at as a positive for, for examining whether or not Probicol could be developed as a treatment for many years disease. Um, and so the first thing we needed to do <coughs> was establish that it could actually uh, prevent oxidative stress cell death in in the ear hair cells. And so this is where the benefit of I had the benefit of uh, Young Jun Seo working with me. He brought down from Korea his uh, HEI OC1 cells. They're basically they're mouse hair cells. They're not exactly hair cells. They're precursor. Um, they're the cells just before they turn into hair cells. So they kind of are mouse hair cells. Anyway, you can grow these cells in a dish, in a little um, in vitro cell culture. And then you can expose them to various drugs that cause uh, ototoxic damage and, 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 and uh, cell stress. Um, one such drug is uh, cisplatin. 
uh, obviously commonly given to people undergoing chemotherapy. One of the reasons why people undergoing uh, chemotherapy, at least 50% of them, uh, which particularly for young kids undergoing chemotherapy, 50% of them lose their hearing is because the splatin causes autotoxic induced hair cell loss in the cochlea. And so we were basically starting out with a view that, well, this would be great as well because we could potentially give this drug to kids undergoing chemotherapy to prevent them losing their, their hearing. Um, and so, but we had we'd established that it worked in, in cells first. We load up the dish with the hair cells with increasing concentrations of cisplatin and, and lo and behold, we get increasing cell death because these cells become increasingly stressed by the presence of cisplatin and they undergo apoptosis and die. If you then say, okay, <laughs> we'll, we'll pick the 20 micromolar cisplatin dose to say, okay, well, this is where we don't want to kill off all the cells. We just want to want to have some cells that are heavily stressed and then we're going to take this concentration of, of cisplatin with our um, hair cells and we're going to treat them with probicol and increasing concentrations to see whether or not we can actually prevent these cells from dying and sure enough as we start to increase the concentration of probicol in the bath we rescued uh, most of the cells from from dying and basically got back to almost 100 percent uh, parity with the, the control the control group to prevent cell death in in those in those cells. Um, we looked at using 50 micromolar probicol as a as a concentration because we also then go well, what what concentration of probicol should we be using if we can get it into the inner ear? We looked at using 50 micromolar probicol as a therapy. I won't go into the details. It, we, it was a little bit difficult to get up to that kind of concentration in the inner ear. In the inner ear. So we settled on maybe looking at 20 micromolar probicol as a, a, a therapeutic dose. And so uh, basically we started to look at whether or not we could load up animals who were being treated with sort of chemotherapy drugs or drugs that reduce oxidative stress in their inner ears and treat them with probicol to prevent the, the loss of hair cells. So that's where about in 2020, I started this research in animals where we were treating guinea pigs with canamycin and furosemide, which are basically antibiotic drugs um, and that, that are known to induce oxidative stress uh, and produce cell in, uh, uh, stress-induced hair cell loss in the inner ear. It's a well-established method uh, for essentially killing off a lot of hair cells and making animals deaf. Um, and so we loaded these animals up with canamycin furosemide and in one of their ears, we, we treated with uh, probicol. In the other ear, we either treated with just a gel as a sham or dexamethasone as a positive control. And we recovered the animals for two to three weeks to see if whether or not probicol had any positive effects on their, on their, their hearing profiles. And lo and behold, I won't go through the data uh, in too much detail, uh, but essentially what we found was there, there was significant hearing protection, particularly in the mid frequency ranges uh, in the animals that were treated with probicol. So if you like the white bars here are the normal hearing thresholds of our guinea pigs before they're treated with uh, canamycin furosemide to be deafened. If you treat them with canamycin furosemide, they lose a significant amount of hearing, sort of 40 to 50, B, uh, 40 to 50 dB worth of hearing loss. If you um, simultaneously treat them with probicol, particularly at the mid frequency ranges, they don't lose as much hearing. So you have about a, a 20 to 30 dB protection range. And now that was really positive because this was, this was the first time we'd actually tried this uh, therapy. We haven't optimized the drugs. We haven't optimized the delivery of the drugs or the concentration. Uh, the fact that we saw some significant uh, uh, effects was really positive for us. And if you actually compare, you can look at the data in a slightly different way and compare the treated ear versus the non-treated ear. And there's a basically a, a 20 to 30 dB difference in between treating the animals with probicol versus not treating them with probicol. Dexamethasone, by the way, didn't, didn't have any uh, effect on preventing oxidative uh, stress induced hair cell loss or hearing loss in these animals. And we also, by the way, we assessed hearing loss in the animals using um, uh, evoked potentials. We also went through and uh, did a little bit of a study counting cells in the inner ear of these animals as well. And there was a little bit of evidence suggest that um, the canamycin furosemide caused hair cell loss in these animals, whereas the, un the animals that were, or the ears that were treated with probicol had slightly higher numbers of cells. So there was a bit of a protection of cell death in these ears as well, which was really nice. And that's basically what this research is basically what 
resulted in us winning the uh, Curtin Innovation Award and developing a patent. Uh, we haven't got it into, into clinical trials yet. We're sort of not quite there. We're continuing to work on protocol. One of the next things we're going to do is basically start to use protocol in those in lymphatic uh, high drops animal models to see if I can actually use probicol to suppress high drops. Uh, and if that's the case, then I don't, I dare say it wouldn't be too long before we started to look at whether or not we can actually get probicol into a clinical trial for treating end lymphatic high drops in many of sufferers. All right. Um, so that's a really long backstory in, in sort of getting to the, me talking about uh, we've got some new drugs that we're hoping to develop for for treating many years disease. It kind of goes along the lines of what's already been done globally for treating many years, and there's some good news stories there. But as I mentioned, these therapies, either corticosteroids or Epsilon or Probicol, they're only therapies. They're not cures. They're going to be short-lived, and many years sufferers are going to need regular dosing. Um, and I would say you know, it, oral drugs, popping a tablet is very convenient, uh, but it's not very effective and it can create problems down, down the, the track for, for sufferers. Uh, so from that viewpoint, I think topical drugs, squirting drugs through the eardrum is a much better approach. And there are a lot of researchers around the world who are trying to optimize the delivery of drugs via trans tympanic injections uh, and are also developing uh, little devices that can actually deliver drugs to the, the middle ear cavity or to the inner ear fluids directly via little micro pumps and little drug reservoirs to give many ear sufferer or any kind of inner ear um, hearing imbalance sufferer a therapeutic dose on regular intervals over a very long period of time. And so it might sound blue sky to say well, one day we might have little res drug reservoirs that, uh, that's been surgically implanted into the ear in, in, uh, in various uh, hearing balance sufferers that sort of squirts in a bit of a drug. But there are a lot of groups that are working on that. And even Cochlear, uh, Cochlear Limited, um, are now developing uh, drug delivery devices into their cochlear implant. So it's not as blue sky as it might first sound. There is a lot of movement into this direction. And so, you know, here's some examples of various uh, groups around the world, uh, really recent data, um, where we basically get working on having drug delivery devices work into a cochlear implant, for example, to have drugs prevent fibrosis around implants, or having little microfoam gels that go in with the implant, or devices that can actually actively pump drugs um, onto the round window membrane over a sustained period of time. And I think that this is, uh, it's uh, probably when I first looked at this research about probably eight or nine years ago, I thought, oh, this seems a little bit blue sky, it seems a bit wacko. But the more I look at it, the more I've, I've started to, to realize that getting drugs into the inner ear is a significantly, is a big enough problem that it really does warrant this type of device approach where we're going to get drugs into the inner ear of patients and have the drug do be delivered over a long period of time, just like we have with diabetics, where they now have diabetics have the option of implanting uh, insulin um, uh, drug delivery devices uh, in their bodies where they can basically over a long, over a period of several months, it'll squirt in insulin when their bodies need it uh, to give it an as needed um, kick of insulin uh, when their, their insulin levels go get, get, get too low, low or their glucose levels get too high. Okay, so the question and, and the, the, the situation or the, the case of diabetes there is a nice one because um, with diabetes, for example, and another chronic disorder, um, there are, there's an obvious treatment for, for, for diabetes. You give them insulin and it prevents their glucose levels from going too high. But you don't just sort of load them up with sugar constantly. You have to monitor their blood glucose levels and determine when exactly you're going to give them the, uh, an injection of insulin in order for it to be effective long term. And over the period of the last five to 10 years, various uh, companies, drug uh, delivery companies have worked on these devices now. And as I said, diabetics now have the option to have these little patches where the, they can walk around with the, the blood glucose monitor um, uh, and the drug, the insulin injector in the same unit. So when the, the drug, the, in, the glu blood glucose levels go too high, the device will automatically uh, kick in some insulin and get, it provides what we call a, a closed loop drug delivery device, which is to say, when you're about to have a, a hypoglycemic episode, you get delivered the drug or just before, preferably just before you're about to have a glycemic episode, you get delivered the drug and everything calms down. There's obvious benefits 
for many years disease for this, for example, because a lot of the time, many years sufferers, you're not suffering the symptoms there and then. Okay. And in that situation, we don't want to be delivering you these therapies, which you don't want to be given long term. Ideally, it'd like, we'd like to know when your inner ear is starting to dysfunction and becoming unstable. And that's when we'd like to be able to inject the drug into, into your inner ears. There's already work uh, groups around the world that are working on microfluidic drug delivery devices that are implantable, that can deliver drugs to the inner ear. But the thing that we lack is the sensor, okay? So for, the, for diabetes, they've got glucose sensors in the blood. For, for many ear sufferers, what's the sensor? What do we detect in your ear or in your body that tells us that you're about to have a, 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 a vertigo attack or hearing fluctuation already increasing in tinnitus severity? Um, and can we develop such a, a sensor device? Now, many of you might say, I can tell you, you know, I'm, I get a feeling where I start to get disequilibrium and I could probably predict when I'm start to, about to have an attack. Um, that's nice, but we don't, I don't think the FDA is going to approve a drug uh, delivery device to say, oh, the patient can just simply press the button. When they're starting to feel a bit off, they can start to deliver the drugs. If that was the case, then diabetics would be able to sort of self-administer um, insulin without first doing the pinprick to actually analyze their blood glucose concentration. So the same sort of applies for many sufferers. We don't want you guys just predicting when you're about to have an attack to deliver yourselves with drugs. It's also, there's some other reasons for why you wouldn't want that to have the scenario. You have to have some other objective measure that determines what's going on in your, in your inner ear to tell the device or the, the user themselves when to deliver the drug. Okay, so what, what are we gonna develop? We're gonna develop a closed loop drug delivery system. Other groups are already working on the drug delivery system. What we wanna work on going forwards is the sensor. And there's a lot of ways we could go about this, but one of the ways we've sort of settled on is using what electrochemical sensors for the, uh, which can sense various types of analytes. So these sorts of electrical chemical sensors have been used even to, from for a whole range of different things. Measuring a pH meter is an electrochemical sensor. Um, COVID detectors these days are actually electrochemical sensors. Uh, and they're very sensitive and they're very specific. Uh, for the inner ear many sufferers, we're starting to look at potassium concentration sensors as I'll get on to in a second. Um, and hopefully the, the idea or the blue sky idea is if we can have this sensor determine that you're about to have um, uh, uh, effect or changes within your ear that are undesirable, then we can have that signal a device either via a, a, an iPhone or even just directly to the device itself to then inject the drug, whether it's probocol or epsilon or corticosteroids, inject the therapeutic drug directly into the inner ear to stave off and to suppress the symptoms and so you don't have an attack. Ideally, that's what we want to develop. And I don't think it's as uh, as far away as we potentially, it might actually sound. Um, I'm not an electrochemist. I don't develop these types of sensors or I haven't done in the past. We are already working with a number of researchers around the world. Mosin Asadnia, many of you might know, he, I think he's uh, talked on to this forum before. And can you nod your head? Did you, did you have, yes, I think you had Mosin um, chat to you last yeah, year. He has, yeah. yeah. And so we collaborate with Mosin on these, on the developing development of these devices. Um, we've put in some grant applications moving forwards. I'm doing some of this device development in my lab. He's doing some in his lab. Um, Jay Kim is at the Utah Uni uh, University in the States. He's not a sensor person, but he's a microfluidic drug delivery person. So he creates the little drug delivery devices. And so we, if we can sort of couple our sensors into the drug delivery devices, we can maybe get a system that could be implanted into the middle ear of, of many ear sufferers to provide long-term this sort of uh, closed loop drug delivery system. Okay, the, what do the devices sort of look like? Well, um, you know, they're probably gonna look something like a cochlear implant, very, very, very thin wire with a couple of electrodes. And I should also point out that uh, the cochlear implant has already been used as a uh, electrochemical sensor, okay, in research studies. So you can already use um, uh, cochlear implants that are implanted in the inner ear to determine for example, how much oxygen is within the inner ear fluids, okay? Or to determine how much steroid the cochlear implant has eluded from its, you know, via these various uh, cochlear implant drug injection um, devices. And so it's gonna be, uh, you know, it'll be, you'll have to involve surgically drilling a small hole. This is a guinea pig ear. Uh, and so it's much, much smaller than a human um, inner ear. Uh, and then threading this sort of device just a little way into the inner ear fluids and then sealing it back up. 
it'll then monitor the levels of a particular analyte. Uh, I mentioned potassium and there's reasons for that I'll get onto in a second. Um, and then basically there'll be some backend hardware which will detect the level of that analyte uh, or that, that, that molecule to give us an indication that there might actually be something go going awry in the inner ear of many ear sufferers. And so for, for many ear disease, what are we gonna focus on? Well, potassium is probably the most likely um, marker to go for. And the reason for that is that um, if we believe the scenario that, that mem ruptures of the membranous labyrinth resulting from endolymphatic hydrox overpressure are what causes vertigo attacks and tinnitus and hearing fluctuation because you get endolymph and perilymph mixing within the inner ear. And there's a lot of re research that sort of suggests that this might be at the actual case. So here's the, if you like, the volume of end lymph, as the volume of end lymph increases, increases, increases. And if you're looking at the concentration of potassium outside of the membranous labyrinth, then you get to a certain volume of, of the membranous labyrinth before something pops and you get potassium spilling out into the, uh, the fluids surrounding the membranous labyrinth and the concentration of potassium skyrockets. And so, We'd like to potentially use this uh, sensor to, to detect potassium within the perilymphatic compartments within the inner ear. It's, that should be relatively simple to do. And then use that to determine uh, what the onset of a, a vertigo attack and then to trigger the drug release. Okay, that's a, a first round approach, but it doesn't have to be potassium. We could also, using the same technology, we could measure anything, you know, where it could be um, uh, various neurotransmitters, various markers of oxidative stress, um, and a whole bunch of other, you know, various markers of immune activity as well, uh, could be used to indicate that there is changes in the underlying physiology of the inner ear and trigger a drug delivery device to deliver drugs on as on as as needed basis. Uh, and Mossen has been working on a particular type of uh, sensor that actually will be very sensitive and stable to the levels of potassium within the inner ear over a long period of time. It'll be my job to ultimately uh, insert this and surgically implant it into an animal, induce any lymphatic hydrops, and test whether the device can actually work. Uh, and so I'm going down this path of electrochemistry. It's, there's a whole bunch of different electrochemical methods out there. It's a new field for me uh, to get into. It's a pretty steep learning curve to get my head around all the different electrochemical methods. Um, I won't bore you with it, but essentially, hopefully one day soon, we'll have a very small sensor array and some, uh, some software and some hardware that allows us to detect what's going on in the inner ear of many of sufferers. And the nice thing about that is it'll work with any drug that any company around the world is starting to develop. Um, and it has multiple benefits, not just for many of sufferers, but also for a whole bunch of other inner ear disorders as well. And so I'll just leave it, <coughs> leave it off there um, by also mentioning that the, this particular project has already been given significant funding um, uh, off the back of the philanthropic funding from Mr. Bruce Kirkpatrick, who gave us a very generous donation um, in November of last year. Uh, and that donation will sort of span the next and help us out with the next four years of research. Um, we're gonna need to continue to raise funds and, and get competitive research funding for this, um, for this particular project around developing the inner ear biosensor. Uh, we've got ongoing collaborations with the Ear, ear Science Institute and UWA. We're looking to develop some, some collaboration with Cockley Limited around some other projects, but will help and lead into this project. And we've got a number of other uh, PhD candidates that actually work actively now working in the lab on this particular project as well. Uh, and hopefully, maybe in a year's time, we've got some really positive and, and uh, cool news to represent to, to, to present to this group um, on. And so I'll leave there with a thank you. I'll just uh, thank uh, young Jun Si, who's now returned to Korea, by the way. Uh, we're going to continue to collaborate. I'll mention that the Many Years Research Fund, most of you would probably know that the Many Years Research Fund is slowly winding up or has sort of wound up, not officially, but it's, it's uh, not fulfilling the role it was once, uh, largely because Bruce, uh, who was the driving force behind the Many Years Research Fund, his health is ailing and he's moved from Sydney down to Melbourne. Uh, we've got significant funding and support from the Garnet Pass and Rodney Williams Memorial Foundation. And we are also hoping to have a lot more uh, research, not, not necessarily funding research, but um, um, research support from the Many Years Research Australia group, which is something that we've only just recently setting up. Um, we've got about setting up because now we have 
effectively, we have about four or five institutes around Australia, maybe more, uh, that, are, that are actively involved in many years disease research. And increasingly in Australia, particularly with the NHMRC and the ARC and any kind of research avenue you want to go down for, for competitive research funding, increasingly for these funding avenues, you have to have the support of the community that you're actually trying to help. And that's nice to say, oh, yes, we're supported by the many years community. They're very happy for us to, to do this research. But unless you've actually got formal uh, groups that are established to actively demonstrate and support and guide the researchers, then the funding group, the, the funding um, institutes won't really appreciate or they won't take your word for it. They have to have the word of the, the sufferers themselves. And so many years research Australia will be made up of a group of many years sufferers around Australia and their job will ultimately be to um, to support and advise any research group, not just me, but any research group around Australia that is doing many years research and to provide a voice as the, the sufferer and the community with the, the many years research community, or sorry, the many years community, um, to actually support their research if they're going to, into funding applications, or even if they're just trying to uh, disseminate research results that so they want to get out to the many years community, the many years research Australia group, we'll, we can maybe help with that. Um, they might help with some funding, but that won't be their, their primary goal. They're really the goal is to basically be the voice of, of, of many years that's actually helping guide and supporting many years researchers at the various institutions around Australia. And so that's now just sort of slowly, slowly kicking off. Uh, we also have, I'm just going to stop sharing and switch my, uh, I switch my screen. Let's see if I can do this quickly, okay. do that, and then share screen to say that, uh, to do this one. Okay, hang on. And then so we hopefully soon we'll have a web, this website is not live. Um, it's, I'm slowly starting to develop the website. Uh, the initial committee members of the Many Years Research Australia group, um, one of the things that we'll hopefully ask them to do, and we have some support for this, is to further help provide uh, input into this website to sort of go into the talk, you know, disseminating what projects are being done on many years disease around Australia, who's doing them, do they need help, do they need patients, do they need um, subjects, mm -hmm. and just to provide many years sufferers this understanding that there is many years research occurring around Australia uh, at the moment, um, and that they shouldn't feel so much like that you know, the, it's a forgotten disease that no one cares. There are a lot of many years re researchers around Australia um, that are that have multiple research projects focused on on curing and solving and, and preventing and helping many years sufferers. So um, hopefully that that website gets up and running soon, and we can provide uh, via Anne um, this group uh, with more details about the many years research Australia. All right, I will end my presentation there and hand okay, back. Okay, that's great. Thanks, Daniel. So perhaps, Julianne, you can start doing the questions. If there, we'll, we'll give about 10 minutes for questions because we've run a call. Cool. Um, Daniel, thank you very much. It was very informative and um, you're giving us hope that something is coming closer for us. Um, yeah, we've got some questions from people who have been watching the webinar. Um, so Louise Carter is very keen to know if there's a, you think there is a cure coming or that it's very unlikely. Um, I would say I would say a cure is unlikely, um, simply because you know we always throw this term around that many years is this multifactorial. Men, no two many years suffers are the same. I think most of you are probably autoimmune. Some of you are viral induced autoimmune. Some of you are genetic. Some of you have had you know, traumatic uh, damage to the inner ear structure. And so if if someone's had a a disruption, a physical disruption to the end lymphatic sac, and that's resulted in many years disease. You're not going to give that particular sufferer gene therapy to to help them cure their many years disease. Even if you could somehow determine that uh, and and uh, um, uh, subcompartment the various many years sufferers into their different subpopulations, and then say, okay, we've now worked out which group of the many years sufferers have a genetic um, under uh, basis for their disease. Well, now you've got to say, well, I'm going to come up with gene therapy for, for many years disease to somehow get a virus with a gene into the inner ear, have that spread around throughout the inner ear without it doing too much damage. Um, it, gene therapy for the inner ear is coming, for not for many years disease, but it is coming for hearing loss. It's still at least 
I would say 20 or 30 years away if I'm being generous because there's just so much to consider. Um, gene therapy can work if you've got a very simple genetic disorder, but I don't think many as disease is a simple genetic disorder. It's going to be a disorder that has multiple genes. If it's genetic in, in nature, there'll be multiple genes that, are just, that, that uh, have gone awry. And that, you know, as I said, there will be many causes. So I don't think there's a cure. I think there's a, an effective therapy is coming. Okay. Yes. Uh, Richard asks, um, is there anything for people who are past the vertigo so they don't have vertigo anymore? Um, and sorry, it just <laughs> ran off the screen. Um, yeah, so they don't have vertigo anymore, but they endure severe chronic bilateral balance disorder. Is there anything to help them with that? Um, that's always going to be a hard one. I, you know, you're, we're assuming that someone who's sort of in that burnout stage and no longer having vertigo attacks, but they've got balance disorders. Effectively, what we think is their vestibular systems are so dysfunctional now that they're not working. You have basically, you may as well have just destroyed all of the vestibular hair cells. Um, I don't think that, unfortunately, I don't think there's going to be a, an easy way of recovering their hair cell therapy. The only thing I could say is that there is often these, you do have these strange situations where you know, many of sufferers who had zero hearing, they hadn't had, hadn't had hearing for five, six years, or had really bad, no balance in a particular, um, in a particular ear. And then during surgery, uh, so they, where they go to get a cochlear implant in, something happens and they relieve the pressure and all of a sudden they can hear again. And so there is often cases where suddenly function can come back because the end lymphatic pressure that was causing them to have no hearing or no balance is suddenly relieved. So I wouldn't say there's no hope for them to um, get their balance function back. Um, but uh, my gut tells me that they've probably lost a lot of their vestibular hair cells and they're not going to be recovered. It might be that they haven't lost vestibular hair cells and we can maybe have a drug that reduces the high drops and they miraculously get balance function back. But I don't, if I'm being honest, I don't know. And I probably would think there's not a lot of hope once you've lost that level of, of balance function that you're going to get it back. So, so I'm sorry. Yep, that's okay. Um, Scott asks if uh, he says injury wasn't listed as a cause, and that's also what I believe caused my many airs. Oh, yeah. But I think you answered that just a little bit uh, a while ago. Um, yeah, I think yeah, there's, you, you hear these people who have had basically you know, car accidents or whatever, yeah. and then they, they develop. And then I think there's some really nice uh, research done about three or four years ago, some groups in the States where they had some histology, histological examples of many of sufferers that had had a car accident and showed physical trauma to the end lymphatic sac. And that was a pretty clear case for what might be causing their high drops. Yeah. Um, I'm, I've got one from Travis from um, Dizzy's Down, Dizzy's Down Under. He wants to know how we can get rid of the fullness or the pressure feeling in our ear. Um, yeah, that's again, uh, not, um, not a simple one. So I, I don't have any magic tricks. I mean, I think, you, you know, probably the best people to answer that would be other many ear sufferers I mean, how do mm. they do it? Um, there is no drug that we know that can do it. Um, uh, you know, I, I'd have all sorts of theories, but I have no idea if they'd work um, in terms of getting rid of the fullness in the ear. Uh, I think sometimes we tend to think that the feeling of fullness in the inner ear may not actually be because the ear has got significant pressure. It might be that <laughs> if you lose a lot of your, your low frequency hearing, uh, without any hydrostatic pressure, do you naturally have this sensation that your ear is full just because you're not hearing any low frequencies? And so maybe amplifying low frequencies um, could maybe help with that. Um, I don't know. Uh, but it, you know, I, I'm always interested to see what happens with these, you know, the increased involvement of uh, hearing aids and there's this progression of hearing aids. Now, many of you would be aware that, you know, they've got the implantable hearing aid or the, 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 um, the medical hearing aids and now you've got these sort of other ear pod type devices that are evolving to change the way we hear uh do people that have those on for a longer period of time that have with amplified low frequency sounds do they start to sort of feel like there's less fullness in the inner ear that's but that's all me just hand waving i've got no evidence yeah. to suggest yeah that. I've um, got a cochlear implant and I think that my ear fullness and pressure is much less now that I've got the cochlear implant. I can definitely tell when I don't have it on, my ear feels more pressure and more full. Yeah. 
when you don't have it on your feet. Yeah, when I don't yeah. have it on, I can tell. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. There's another question here from Kim who says, if you don't know your cause for many ears and you have it unilaterally, so one ear, what should we be doing to protect our other good ear? <laughs> um, crossing your fingers? No, I, I don't know. I mean, it's, um, <laughs> Yeah, I, until we've got a drug that can prevent it, um, that I don't think, I mean, you, you could maybe say, you know, work with your doctor to say, if, if, if a treatment is working, if you find that there is a particular treatment, or if you're going to give systemic drugs in the ear that's bad, and you're finding that relief from corticosteroids, you know, that it helps temporarily, you might work with them and say, well, what are the chances you actually also give it my good ear? Just to, maybe they, they'd probably say they won't do it. Um, but mm. I mean, that, that would be my only advice to sort of say there's not, you know, if something, if a drug does work, don't be averse to maybe seeing if you can put it in the other ear as well to make sure that it doesn't go bilateral. But I, I, it might be the one of those things you should maybe not be too fearful over. I, I don't know. Yeah. And I've got a question from me. <laughs> Why um, did you decide to study many ears disease? Um, it's an interesting one. So when I was going through university, I knew I wanted to go into neuroscience. Um, probably second year of university, I remember I had uh, a very passionate lecturer um, who we sort of had an engineering background, and he sort of taught us about the the the, the inner ear and the cochlea, and and it, it's naturally the, the inner ear because it's so complex and there's a lot of mechanics and physics involved. It's not, and I sort of had that bit of a pinch on for those that, that type of research anyway. So it was sort of drawn to understanding the inner ear. And I remember this sort of, I think I just learned about um, aquaporins and, and, um, and, uh, um, uh, um, and anti-fluid drugs and anti-diuretic drugs. Um, and, I was sort of saying, well, why don't we just give many air sufferers antidiuretic drugs? I mean, isn't that antidiuretic drug doesn't increase the levels of aquaporins on tissues? And couldn't that maybe help with relieving the, the fluid increase in, 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 in lymphatic high drops? And I sort of went down this, just, just as a young student does, you think, oh, I'm onto something here. Maybe I, for all of a sudden I felt smart. And I was the first time at university, I felt smart. And uh, sort of went down a rabbit hole of studying um, the effects of antidiuretic drugs on the inner ear and kind of came up with a bunch of things and took it to the, the lecturer at the time. And he said, well, it's really impressive that you're gone now because that's exactly what people are now looking at for treating many ears and yeah. felt smart, but subsequently realized that it wasn't a thing. <laughs> uh, but, but by the way of that, I had a, developed a bit of a, um, a, a relationship with that lecturer who ended up being my PhD supervisor. So that's kind of how I got into inner ear research. Cool. One more question, um, Julianne. We're one more? Time. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Louise is asking, should we be eating um, berries for <laughs> antioxidants? Well, that's, it's interesting. There's a lot of groups that have actually looked at, um, uh, there was, there's a lot of research, particular, probably about 10 years ago, maybe still ongoing, um, what antioxidant drugs, or sorry, antioxidant diets should be people with um, in-ear disorders be, be taking and eating? And there was, you know, high doses of of um of um red bull I and mean, red bull's got a you know taurine really powerful antioxidant in it with basically there's various groups saying oh have this food have that drink because antioxidants are great for the inner ear and they were trying to work out whether or not um you know high levels of antioxidants in your diet can be beneficial to our hearing i don't know where that went to uh, that research i don't know what the net outcome of it, whether or not you can get enough antioxidants in your diet to have a significant clinically significant um effect on your hearing but it's worth a try definitely yeah, i don't don't put blueberries in your ear though i would say <laughs> <laughs> there yes. was a question i'd put in there okay. yeah asked um and it was when you talked about the drugs that have been shown to assist with um, increasing hearing and the reduction in tinnitus, because um, tinnitus was one of the things that a lot of us have in common. Yeah. Um, it was a theme when we got together at Christmas time. I just thought that that was very interesting. I know it was very early on in your talk, but yeah. Yeah, like uh, tinnitus is a difficult one. Um, I, I've always shied away from tinnitus because it is very complex in its nature. Um, going back to this idea, actually, most of the people that were doing the antioxidant research in the diet were actually focused on tinnitus because, of, you know, and they were in the, a lot of it was done in the UK, the Tinnitus Association, the UK group were quite 
uh, prevalent. I think they had a lot of funding and were funding a significant trial of, of antioxidants in the diet for treating um, tinnitus. And so hopefully, hopefully these antioxidant drugs are also very effective for, for tinnitus. I know that the Epsilon, one of the, the outcomes of that was a significant improvement in, in hearing, but it was also a significant reduction in the in yeah. tinnitus. So uh, yeah, it, it, it's it's likely that it, again it won't it probably won't cure the tinnitus, but hopefully if it's yeah, particularly if you get it, if you'd start treatment earlier early enough, um, then it might prevent the progression of tinnitus. And can any of these drugs actually help you regrow the ears? Because that's one of the things we get damaged mm -hmm. to the ears and our ears. And just you were talking about that earlier with the yeah. cancer patches and the treatment. I thought that was mm -hmm. interesting. No, that that these that's the point is these drugs they're not a cure they're not going to regrow. We, I'm working actively. We got some. Um, we we do have. I'm working with a group that got funded large amount of funding, uh, middle of last year, to actively work on gene therapy to regrow hair cells in the inner ear. Um, and so when I say, you know, gene therapy to regrow hair cells is 10 to 30 years away, I, you know, I say that quietly because in the grant, we're sort of saying this could be five years away, but mm -hmm. it's, it's, there's a lot of problems with it. Um, but uh, but the, the, the therapies, the drug therapies that we're, I've been sort of talking about focusing on aren't, they're not going to help regrow hair cells. Um, they are really just to prevent ongoing damage in the ear. Um, as sort of a, to provide you to prevent the degrees progression, um, and and I and you know there's lots of people suffer lots of or have lots of underlying disorders that they just treat and keep at bay very happily with the sort of daily you know oils and treatments and it's enough. And, I, and for many as community, if you have been a very effective treatment that you don't have to worry too much about, doesn't cost too much, and you can just have it go on for 30 years. Then I think for, I, if I was a mini sufferer, I'd say that's enough. It's not going to cost me an arm and a leg. It's effective. That's all I'm asking. Um, that does it for this evening. Thanks, Daniel. No problems. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you, Gail.